you want to pray and get started into this section or part of the series that we have been trying to develop in regard to marriage, uh, courtship and marriage. And uh, we also trying to put some things right in our marriages uh, so that we might, for those of us who married, because uh, there are people who are coming in who are already married. But if that's not the case, we are trying to help the young people to make informed decisions, informed choices. I want to pray with us before we get to begin because we don't have much time. So let's pray. Holy Father in heaven, I am flesh and blood. Distill and crystallize my thoughts that I may speak only that which will be, as the songwriter said to us a few moments ago, the gospel's joyful sound. I might be able to conquer and fathers in anything right that we've done before. May your will be done in our lives. We prayed by faith in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. Now, friends of Jesus, um, there's a beautiful moment right here to continue looking at the subject of marriage. Now, as we continue, we'll be able to find, and you can take this into your notes, that there are about five, four or five basic pillars for a successful, healthy marriage. And we know that one of those pillars is love. And we'll today delve into the concept of love in our first section of the first step. Uh, is God calling you to marriage? And that is very important. Is God calling you to marriage? Um, it's important for us to see the pillars of marriage, which is anchored under the concept of love. Now, I'm not going to dig deep into that right now. I might later because love or charity uh, uh, is explained uh, in the book of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And Ellen White calls us to read that book every day. And she will tell you about what love, genuine love for humanity and love for God is all about. It if you read that chapter, there is nothing like emotional feelings. It is all principle. For example, love vaunted not. Love does not hate. Uh, love does not get angry and mad. Love does not entertain evil. Uh, love is truthful and all those sorts of things. And so this pillar of a successful marriage, which is love, and and we realize it's not falling into love. It's a principle. And we are going to see how we can be able to identify when someone is loving you by principle and when someone is loving you emotionally. It is, of course, the emotions has to be there if someone loves you. But we're talking about a case where feelings are driving the person and so when the feelings go beyond the frontal lobe which is the center of decision making then you become what is called rather an animal an animal does not know if this is my mother or this is not my mother an animal does uh, probably does not know if this is the right place to do this or this is not the right place to do this and when we become animalic it's because the the, the lower limbic system, which is the system, the endocrinal system, the center from whence all emotions and hormonal reactions are controlled, begins to control our frontal lobe, which is the seat where God puts his seal. And so when youths come to that point, they fall in love. I want us to get that point very, very well. They fall in love. And when you fall in love, no one can advise you. You don't take any counsel. You become um, uh, uh, what I would call um, headstrong. 
you become someone who cannot be cancelled, you become someone who is uh, arrogant, you feel you are right. When actually you want to tell that someone has fallen in love, you will realize that they do not reason, they begin to malreason, though they are of age, but they just begin to malreason, and you will be able to find at the end of the day, they become childish when they think they are old enough. Uh, they become childish. I've told people that if you find an elderly man who wants to get into marriage sagging his trouser or perhaps showing the um, uh, private parts, lady or so on, we have all the questions to put there if they're really mature and they value uh, themselves. So that happens when the, the lower limbic system uh, begins to overpower the center of judgment, uh, the center of reason, the center of decision making, where God puts the seal, the mind. And so that pillar of a successful marriage, which is love, and we'll all find when we come to that, what are the qualities of that love? Well, another good pillar in marriage is trust. Because many marriages are going to fail because there is no trust. You don't trust your partner. Are uh, you always suspecting that if she's on the phone, she's talking to someone else? Or perhaps you're always suspecting that there is something your partner. If you do not have trust in your marriage, you are breaking one of the foundational pillars of that marriage. Trust is very important, including financial trust, being able to transact openly. Your wife knows your password for your MPSA and for your bank accounts and all these things. It, it is not an afterthought. It's something that we have to make decision today. If you're not mature enough to allow your wife in future, to be able to access, I mean, um, I even sometimes attempt my wife uh, to ask her if she remembers the password for some of my accounts. So, so um, yeah, I call them my accounts because sometimes uh, there's some that I operate as a person, but I give her the password. So um, uh, I sometimes do try, just, just, just at least to let her know that, well, you are free uh, to, and sometimes if uh, I realize that um, she is respectful, that she wants to ask me uh, for something like maybe she wants some airtime or some money for food, uh, I would ask her, take the phone and transact. So as much as possible, you should be able to have the trust. It's a very important pillar in marriage. Another important pillar in marriage is respect. There is no one that wants to be demeaned. There is no one who wants their self-esteem to be lowered. There is no one who wants to be embarrassed. There is no one who wants to be spoken to just the way you want, especially in public. And so the way you handle people in public uh, tells a lot as to whether you are, uh, you are ready for marriage and you are prepared for marriage. And so respect is very important. How, how do you address uh, the, the, opposite, uh, the opposite gender, uh, especially even those whom you don't have interest? If you try as much as possible to show off and be arrogant in addressing some people so that you demean them or embarrass them before people, then probably you are going to do that to your wife. And it's not the best thing. You have to be respectful. And respect goes all the way to submission. It's also part where we talk about submission because I remember reading a story from uh, uh, George Muller. If you've never heard from George Muller, this is a guy you're going to read about. I have printed a book um, uh, about missionary experiences because my son, we named him after missionary, we are praying he will be one. But really what I'm saying is uh, I printed a book about George Mola, his missionary experiences. I think uh, Joseph Bates, uh, what is the name of this guy? Uh, there is this guy, David Livingstone, exactly. So the concept uh, that he was bringing out here in regard to respect and submission 
that worked out in the life of a man who was not a Christian and in the life of a woman who was not a Christian. In fact, as I speak to Christian families, I need to insist in this. A young man once asked me why many present truth believers don't have happy marriages. And I'm like, what do you mean, really? But it's true that what we show outside there might not be pro probably what we are feeling inside of our marriages. And I think our marriages are going chaotic because we make wrong decisions. And Ellen White has written somewhere, I'll be going into the Bible and the writings of Ellen White later, but let me just make this foundation that respect and submission are very important. Respect and submission are very important in order to experience a healthy marriage. Why do I say so? In this story, Mullah brings the life of a man who was a drunkard. But yet in his state of drinking and coming home late, his wife would wait for him. His wife would welcome him home in love. His wife would hug him. His wife would take off his dirty clothes and his wife would put them aside, even sometimes wash him, bathe him, and then would give him food and lead him to the place of rest. Now, one day, he was sharing with his peers, his friends outside there, concerning what his wife does to him, and his friends didn't quite believe. And so one day they peeped in as they went and they saw the wife do exactly that. And they came and asked the man, why would you do such to such a lovely wife? And that man had to spend some moments alone. He spent some moments alone thinking at how unselfishly without complaint, without mama. His wife has spent time waiting for him, taking his mess, hiding his mess, not telling it to the community, watching him. Tomorrow he leaves a clean man. He drinks himself in the evening. He comes back. The wife does, and he felt about the walls that he is brought in the life of his wife. And he reformed. And he became one of the people who actually propelled this gospel. So what, I'm, what am I bringing to you? Trust is very important, or rather respect and submission. There are many of us that just because, perhaps, let me talk to those who are married a little bit, just because our wives don't believe like we believe. We are outside there, we are saying every nasty thing about them, how they are headstrong and how they'll be lost and we are castigating and saying all these things. You know, sometimes we need to read what the Bible says. Uh, let's go to the book of, uh, we're studying now in the Bible. As I was just mentioning those pillars, understanding is another pillar. Do you have understanding? Do you understand the emotions of your girlfriend, your fiancé? Do you understand the emotions of uh, your wife? Do you understand how your wife communicates when she's not happy with something? Do you understand how your wife communicates when she's happy with something? Do you know how your wife asks for things? There are people who will never outrightly ask for things. It's their personality. Do you understand them? Do you understand them? So that understanding is just another pillar. Let's go to the book of Ephesians because we promised that we'll go to the book of Ephesians this time. and. Um, the book of Ephesians, chapter number five. This is very important. In fact, there is no book I love as much as the book of Ephesians that I'm talking about the concept of love, marriage, and courtship. Listen, um, um, the, the Bible says in chapter five, reading from verses number 25, husbands love your wife, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So right here on my table, I have learned something today. And um, I want to say this. What is it that I've learned? This is what I have learned. I have learned and I've written it on, on one of the papers here. It will remain here for quite some time. Love is giving. Love is not receiving. Love is not about receiving. Love is about giving. Love is not about 
not receiving. And so if I have to love, I don't expect uh, to receive, all right? If I receive, praise the Lord. But it's not a condition for love. Love is about giving. And that's why agape love is the perfect example of love. Above all the other love, you know, love and all, all these others, uh, uh, other sorts of love. Love uh, is about giving. It's not about receiving. And so that's why the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he did what? He received. He gave his only begotten son. So true love is about receiving. If you are in a marriage or you are in courtship where you expect to receive, always, you want a good wife, you want a wealthy wife, you want a um, person who can be able to quote the scripture you want you are it's about receiving in fact i'll mention to you one thing you should never pray for a good partner a good fiance a good girlfriend a good wife you should be praying to be a good person the good fiance to someone the good wife or husband to someone you should be praying to be the right person for someone don't pray for someone to be the right person for you. As long as you are the right person, God will lead you to the right person, a good person. And so if we keep praying for that woman who is humble and we are not humble, respectful and we are not respectful, loving and we are not loving, we're not going to get that. Because our burden is fast. We have to reflect the perfect image of Jesus Christ before we ask him the people to reflect the perfect image of Jesus Christ. And so it is our duty that we go before and to ask God to reproduce his character in our lives before we ask God to produce his character in the lives of other people. And so that's why I'm beginning by saying love is giving. It is not receiving. What is it that you are going to give into this love? It is not what am I going to receive into this love. And so I see this woman and I think their family is wealthy and so I'm entering into this marriage. Or because I think that this marriage, uh, this woman is hardworking, she cooks nice food and that's good and blah, 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 blah. So you you all about giving. What is it that you are going to give to this marriage? That is important for me. And so the Bible says in verses number 25, it's so important, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for the church. So the love that Christ showed to the church was to the extent that Christ gave himself for the church. Very important for you to know that. Christ gave himself for the church. And so husbands, it's a high calling. If you fall in love, you cannot give yourself. You cannot risk. Those who fall in love, they will run away when you are in trouble. They are in that relationship when it is fit enough to be in that relationship. They are in that relationship when things are good, when there are no trials, when money is flowing, when the car is working, when you are buying property, and when you are doing all these things. They are in that relationship when you are that man who is a prospective engineer about to be employed by some big company, you are working there. Uh, they are there for something. Because they have not learned from this verse that Christ says that love your wife. As Christ loved the church and he gave himself. You need to understand that because that's very important. And so Christ, in loving the church, gave himself. The greatest demonstration that Christ gave for, to show and prove that he loved the church, of course, together with the Father, is that he gave himself. And so when did Christ give himself? Was it when the church was doing very well? Was it when the church pleased uh, Jesus and the Father? Suddenly not. This is when Christ gave himself. For while you were still sinners, 
Christ gave himself. And so the long suffering, the forbearing, the patience, because we will talk about patience. We will talk about patience when we are dealing with marriage. Because if today I told my other friend who is in uh, uh, Israel, and one time this friend of mine is pretty cheeky. So he told me, Brother Zadok, let's have a meeting. And so when I went to have a meeting with him, I delayed because of the normal traffic jams in Nairobi. But he told me, you know, Brother Zadok, you knew that there's a traffic jam. So from that time, I've learned to keep time, if you didn't know. I try as much as I can. But then he rescheduled the meeting to the next day. But now, I want you to see this. If ever I was to meet my, uh, I don't have a guy, I have a girlfriend who is my wife now. But if I was ever to meet her then, and uh, I remember one time we did, and I was a bit offended, and this was the reason. I was coming from the farthest, and I think I arrived the earliest. But I think she tested and proved that I was a little bit impatient. And so the question should be, are you going to be patient enough. Your patience is going to be tried because patience is one of the qualities that if we don't have in marriage, we will be making hasty decisions before we think. If you don't have patience, then the lower limbic system will be prompting you faster than the uh, central, I mean, the, the forward wheel. Uh, you will be angry so fast. You will be, I mean, speaking before you think and then so on and then you regret later. So the concept is, if for example, I tested my, my wife, you tested your girlfriend, hey, let me perhaps uh, somewhere at the city center in Nairobi or wherever you're coming from in Kampala and this person delayed or even uh, uh, switched off their phones and they didn't come. How would you react to that? Will you listen to this lady or this gentleman to hear his story? Well, if you will give that time, eh, that, 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 that's, that's a point. That's, that's a step up. And so this is very important. So Jesus Christ, he proved that he loved the church by giving himself to the church. It is very important. Husbands, love your wife even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Um, a, 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 a minister once asked this, and this is very important. And this is this is not possible. But suppose in heaven there was only one chance. We know that that cannot be the case. But we're trying to ask if there was only one chance in heaven. And so it's between you and your wife. And then you, man, you are told or asked to. Choose who among the two of you will take that chance. Who do you choose? Well, I'm trying to bring you to speed with this verse. Uh, brother, uh, 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 brother Ako is saying hey, it's very tricky. But I'm trying to help you understand this verse. That Jesus was willing to risk eternal loss for the salvation of humanity, the church. He was willing to risk being lost forever. That is how we should be risking for the sake of helping our partners to be part of the heavenly family. And especially men. So, men, the calling that you are being called with into marriage is a calling to be able to put yourself as the sacrificial lamb on the altar for the sake of the person you want to get married. So I'm talking to men right at that point, because we will be talking to women about submission. But I understand that if I want to get married, I have to understand myself as a man, that God is calling me to put myself in the place of the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world that actually came. And that's why... We also move with Jesus Christ. He becomes the priest up there. We become the priests of the family, bearing the burdens and the sins of the family. We need to understand that. You're the one who's going to pray more. You're the one who's going to bear more burdens. But this has been reversed because men and men have become more of um, 
loose in terms of understanding the gospel as it relates to them in their family. And so it says, Christ, who was willing to die, are you willing to die? Or you this man will really elope when he realizes that things are not working out so fast. It says, listen to verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. What was the purpose? That he might sanctify. And so the purpose by which, for which, we enter into marriage, we realized before is to reproduce the perfect image of Jesus Christ because it takes two Christians to make a successful marriage. It takes one person to break that marriage and send it into a divorce. It doesn't need two. And so that is very important. And then we realize that marriage is a union between two sinners. Now, when I say sinners, I'm not saying unbelievers. Well, whatever case you want to look at it, but marriage is not between two perfect people. It's between two imperfect people who actually want to mold themselves. Now, that does not mean unbeliever, a believer, no. But if I am a believer, I must understand that I am imperfect. I'm not the perfect guy here. And my wife is to understand that she's not the perfect guy here. And so we are all having our weaknesses and we want to come together and strengthen ourselves so that I can bear a weakness and lift her up in her weaknesses while she lifts me up. It's very important. But remember, the Bible here says that, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the water by the word. And so the word is very important as we enter into marriage but let's get more practical that he might present into uh into himself a glorious church verse 27 not having what not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be only and without blemish so you have a work and a duty as a man to present your wife holy and acceptable now this is going to be really trying and I'll tell you, marriage is not a bed of roses as people think. All the hype that people go through and before, and I've given you these stories. Some of them, I'm not discouraging you. It's beautiful. Um, but at the same time, we need to tell you the truth. It's not a bed of roses. Because all the hype might just die in two or three. Uh, which verse are you reading kindly? Ah, uh, yes, we are reading chapter 5, and from chapter 5 of Ephesians, from verse 25, we are looking at the principles, uh, um, uh, 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 this principle number one, is God calling you into marriage, and, and, and we're just trying to see how high that calling is for men. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of, uh, uh, of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, but that it should be only and without blemish. So by the end of it, we are looking forward to a family that is holy without blemish. Children that are praising the Lord, it's not difficult, but by the grace of God, it's possible. Now, if any man says it's impossible, then he doesn't believe on the call of Christ that we may be perfect as their father is perfect. So we can have perfect happy marriages right and we should be the ones who are having that those sort of marriages i mean we've lived in a time and age where it's difficult for christians to hold their hands man and wife i'm telling you uh, the world the world would better express a love and uh, though they do not have the blueprint of love but unfortunately the, the christians We've come to a point where the love that Jesus is describing here is alien to us. And that's why I told you, a young man asked me, uh, Bro Zadok, I mean, why isn't marriages working for many people whom we thought to have known advanced truths? And it's true. It's because we've not learned these principles and prayed long enough. We'll talk about that later. And so it talks about 28, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. How much do you love your body? That's the question we're asking ourselves. That you should love your wives as you love your own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Just as much as you love your own body. So if you're going to eat outside there, 
uh, having nice food, I, I mean, I, I, I am a preacher, so I do walk to go preaching. And sometimes I think if I'm given a very nice food where I go to, well-prepared bed and I am there and just relaxing and all these things, if I didn't go with my family, I think about how, how are they doing wherever they are? How are they doing wherever they are? Do, do they have the same privilege? Are, are they also enjoying the food? Are they comfortable? These are things that sometimes you will be able to see are, are, are very important. And then he says, for no man ever uh, ate his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord does to the church. And now I'll stop there. I'll come back to this verse later. Remember that the purpose for which God is calling us into marriage. Um, uh, go with me to John chapter 16, verse 24, if you don't mind. John chapter 16, verse 24. This is what the Bible says. Verse 24, either two, have you asked nothing in my name? Ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full. Why is God calling us into marriage? That our joy may be full. Purposely, nothing more. The purpose for which we are called into marriage is that our joy may be full. But do many of us have a joyful marriage? Uh, certainly not. Research reveals that 50% of the marriages contracted today end in divorce. Now, we're not talking about people who are struggling behind the curtains, behind what we can be able to see, who are giving a wrong impression while in their homes, uh, uh, I, mean, I mean, there is suffering, they are fighting, they are beating one another, they, they, they are insulting one another, the children are having a bad mood. I tell you of a fact. 50% of the marriages that are being contracted today are entering into divorce. They are entering into divorce. And it's a pitiful thing that marriage was designed to show us two things. When God created man and woman, do you know how I a lesson that was to the angels? The Bible says, for the purpose of angels. God did that. The angels are not understanding one mystery, how Jesus was the son of God. For their purpose, God created man and woman, submissive to the man, man loving the woman, to be able to demonstrate to the angels the mystery of God, or, or, of the garden, or in the garden. That's how huge and how big that is. That the relationship between the father and the son was to be demonstrated in the creation of man and woman and in the unity of man and woman. Any man who does not understand that relationship cannot treat marriage and express the aspects of marriage wholly. That's how high. And so the purpose of marriage was that joy may be full, that your joy may be full, right? Now, but realize that while this is the ideal that God is giving us, God cannot force us. If we allow our lower limbic system to go ahead of our frontal lobe, God is not going to force us, as it's written in the book of um, the book of Psalms, chapter one forty-five, verse sixteen. Let's go there, because we need to understand God is telling us to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to us. If we do not seek the righteousness of God, if we seek to fulfill our own desires and our own pleasure, let me tell you. Marriage is not an evangelistic campaign. Marriage is not an evangelistic campaign. No one gets married to a person who is an unbeliever and then begins to open a crusade. He does prophecy in the morning and he does a Bible study in the evening and saying, I will convert my wife and make my wife to be a Christian. Now, my brother, don't try that at home. If it worked for someone, don't you ever try it. And God judges cases differently. There are people whom it will work simply because they were ignorant. But when you know how to do good and you do it not, God winks no more, friend of Jesus. And alas be unto us that we should take that direction. Marriage is not where we are going to do an evangelistic campaign. No, it's not. That's not about marriage. Marriage is not where we are going to say that we can mess today, but when we get into marriage, we are going to correct those masses. 
That's not it. It's not going to work that way. God is telling us in 105, or 145, sorry for that. 145 of the book of Psalms, a beautiful book. Uh, now, what do I mean by an unbeliever? I'll be coming to that. An unbeliever, basically for now, for your information, I don't know if you'll be there during that time. An unbeliever is anyone who believes unlike you. Now, I need to, I, I need to distill that so that you just understand that. If by any means you are both, for example, Seventh-day Adventists, um, an unbeliever here, I'm not talking about an atheist, I'm not talking about a Catholic, it might be a Catholic, but not limited to that. It can be a Seventh-day Adventist while you're a Seventh-day Adventist. For example, that there are primary beliefs that you cherish, but the other partner do not own and cherish those beliefs that you hold so dear to you. Are going to, you're going to have difficulty in that marriage. And here we are not talking about the issue of good, better, best. Here we are talking about the issue of is it sin or is it righteousness? Why am I saying? When you get hooked up uh, with a woman, for example, who does not believe on the sanctity of the Sabbath, but is a Seventh-day Adventist, she's baptized perhaps, so she was born, but she does not believe on the sanctity of the Sabbath. She does not take Sabbath seriously. She does not take the reform messages seriously, for example. She does not believe the distinctive messages of Adventism. And here you are, you are a minister, and you believe these things and teach them so passionately. And this lady takes an opposite direction. Now, we, we are not talking about cases where the lady is a willing learner. She does not know, not because she's chosen to, she has not had the opportunity to know. That's a different case. She has had the opportunity to know. She insists being an Adventist by baptism, good standing, taking Holy Communion, but is careless about her dress, careless about what she watches. There are many Adventists like that. You are careful about what you watch. You are careful about dress. You are careful about what you eat. If the two of you get hooked up, what I call, if you get into an engagement and exchange vows, it's going to be chaotic in most cases. And so that's the sense in which the Bible calls one a believer and the other one an unbeliever. So an unbeliever could be someone who does not believe the present truth, or the messages that you hold so dearly to yourself. All right. So I hope that that, that would be well. Thank you for asking the question, sister. But it can also be someone uh, who perhaps is not with you in the same faith, quote unquote, in the same church. Perhaps he's a Catholic. Perhaps he's a Sunday ke uh, keeper or a Muslim. And, and, and you are someday, you are going to have difficulty because you say marriage is not a crusade. So chapter 145, if you are there, and I'll just get back to that in a little while. Uh, chapter number 145 is interesting, dear people, and it says in verse 16, if you read with me, Thou openest thine hands and satisfies the desires of every living thing. So God is not going to force anyone. Remember we said, if you make up your mind to marry someone, God will not force you against your will. God opens his hands and gives every man the desires of their heart and because force for God is the last resort of a last of, of a false religion. So the question will be, are you making God let you have your way? God will show you the principles as we are showing right now, but he will not force you to change direction. He will not. He will let you follow the path that you've chosen to follow. But you must know that every decision has a consequence. And I like saying it this way. That while you have the freedom to choose the direction to take, or which option, or which choice, you don't have that freedom to choose the consequences. You cannot say that though I made this decision, I would not want this consequence. These are the consequences that I want. We don't have a choice on the consequences. While we have a choice, 
on the directional choices or uh, directions we can take with the issue in regard to marriage. But once we have made that decision, that we are taking this direction, we cannot choose the consequences. We cannot say, okay, God, perhaps I can be able to stomach this behavior in my wife, but no, this one, don't let it come. No. Once you've made a wrong decision, the consequences of that wrong decision, you will not choose them. It's automatic. They come because if you didn't want them, you would have made that decision against that direction before. And so that is very important. Now listen to this, our uh, friends of Jesus. I have a few quotes here that you need to be listening to. Ellen White says, and this is what we use to know our poster today. Let every step, uh, Adventist Home 49, paragraph 1. Let every step towards marriage alliance be characterized by modesty, simplicity, sincerity, and earnest purpose to please and to honor God. Marriage affects the afterlife both in this world and in the world to come. A sincere Christian will make no plans that God cannot approve. No sincere Christian is going to make plans that God cannot approve. But what are some of the markers of that marriage that are pleases to God, oh friends of Jesus? Modesty, simplicity, sincerity. So then, well, what, what is simplicity? Marriage, uh, when you are actually going to get into courtship, engagement, and then into marriage, finding the right partner. One of the mistakes that people do is to make themselves who they are not. And so people over display uh, what essentially they are not. Page number 49. Thank you. Page number 49, brother or woman. So People are very own for denial. People tend to display who they are not. What do I mean? I have my shirt here. I love my shirt, and uh, it's a good shirt. I don't have to. I don't have to dress poorly if I was going to meet uh, my friend and uh, someone whom I want to be married. However, I can choose, uh, brother Milton, you to talk. I can choose sometimes to uh, uh, present myself, Brother Gordon Milton, please mute yourself. Right, thank you. Uh, uh, I can decide perhaps to present myself in a way that does not portray who I am. Now, when I get married to the woman, the woman realizes this is not the man I married. Because I remember a time when uh, a man actually sued a lady for makeups. Because the lady used to put makeups. I mean, her hair was on wigs and weaves and this. I'll, I'll talk about these things. An interesting talk, isn't it? And uh, she was in this kind of paints. And so when the reality came, I mean, the reality check, you understand? When they were in the house, you know, you can't put makeups all the time. When, when do you think your husband needs to know, see you as a beautiful woman? It's not when you're outside there. It's right when you're with him in the house. So he sees a different person. Like, man, I mean, I was cute. I, I was lied. So you make yourself who you are not. I'll tell you one thing. And then you might not agree with it. But our first, you call it date, we had in my wife. This was my food. And I was taught by someone, a very beautiful couple, an elder, and, uh, and uh, I, I love these guys. They are very simple. But in our first date, I, I told my wife, what I love is Gideri. I used to call it in our, in our mother tongue, uh, 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 So I told her, but if you want to make me a special Gideri, I don't know its name in English, but it's simply maize mixed with beans. And this time I told her, I need some groundnuts mixed inside there. That's my best food. And so my wife cooked it. She was my fiance then. And she packed it. And then we went uh, to have a talk and consider uh, a few things before we would work. I was being one up. Uh, I'm not saying you have to love what I love. Uh, that's what I loved. So, 
you can choose to be who you are not. You are not sincere. You can be untruthful. You can present yourself like, all right, uh, the man with the best phone and uh, you're struggling to carry phones that don't work alongside and trying to call people and making all these things. Uh, you know this uh, behavior commonly with people who God have mass come from the lakeside. Let me tell you the truth. God says we need to be modest, simple, and we need to be, God says, uh, modest, simple, sincere. And the purpose for which we are uniting is to please God. If you realize that you are in a relationship whereby you cannot pray when you're with a sister, friend, put question marks. Taking a wrong direction. If you're in a relationship where you cannot sit down perhaps in a public park and just tell your wife, uh, my dear, I would want us to pray before we start off. Uh, our conversation that means that already the lower limbic system is overriding and you are most probably entering into infatuation if you have not but now let's uh, read a few more quotes for you to understand this concept of his god calling now you have to realize ellen white says in messages to young people 455 satan is constantly busy to hurry inexperienced youths into a marriage alliance. What is Satan doing? Is hurrying. So is Satan interested in your marriage? Yes. And that's why we are asking the question, is God calling me? Is God calling you, young man? Because Satan is hurrying. And Ellen White says that many of the marriages today, as they are contracted today, God has nothing to do with those marriages. God has completely nothing to do with those marriages. So you might, might be able to think, Satan is doing what? He's hurting people. He's hurting people. People are so infatuated. People are crazy. People are entering into debt. Our best couples told us while they were canceling us over family, they, they led to the, uh, of, up the ISIS and how this family went into debt. The, the couples went into debt. They slept in the hired car that night on the church compound. The man was wondering how to pay the debts. They were infatuation and craze and all these things. Satan is hiring people into marriage. He's, he knows that if he wants to mess your spirituality, let him attack your marriage life. And people do not know that one of the worst things you can experience today if you are a follower of Christ, is a marriage that is not working. There is nothing so bad as a minister who stands in the podium realizing his marriage is not working. There is nothing so bad as one who stands as an elder or a youth leader or a deacon when they realize that whatever they are presenting to the church is not.
Yeah, uh, it's like we've lost Brother Zadok, and I've just informed him. And uh, let's hope he, he will be joining. Sorry for that. It's, it's, it must have been my network. Uh, it's because I'm, I'm not spotting enemies. So um, the concept is if Saturn can mess our families, he will mess the church. He will mess the church. And so I have done my own study and my research. Saturn is messing our families than any other thing. If there is something that we need to be on our knees praying for young people is that we form families that can please God. And that can be an example to the world. And that's my prayer. God help me. God help my family. Help that family. Do you even sometimes spend time praying for families? Just mentioning families randomly. People whom you know. Mentioning them. Praying for them. And asking God, please take hold. It pains me when you have to sit in meetings to sort out issues of uh, disagreements in families of believers. And you have to sort out this. And all these cases are ever there. You only need to open your ears and listen. And friends, I can tell you, when I tell you 50% of marriages are struggling, that are being contracted today. It is true. I sit sometimes and listen to these things and I ask God, why did you call me to this ministry? Some of these things are too weight. Too weight. Let me talk to you about something here. Uh, Ellen White says, Saturn is constantly busy adding in experienced youths. Who is an ex inexperienced youth? We can talk about that uh, in a long conversation. But inexperience might be in responsibilities. In terms of emotional management. All right? In terms, can, can, can the lady manage the emotions? Or is this person whom uh, a little while uh, she gets something that hurts her, and she begins talking about, you know, now I'm suffering because I come from the poor family. I'm suffering because I'm the one who was single parent. And I'm suffering because I'm the poor person here. You have a job. Or the man is that person who is still childish. He's inexperienced emotionally. He's a child emotionally. You talk to someone and you know if they are ready to be parents. I actually one day called a young girl in the church and asked her, my sister, you like my daughter, I might say, you are entering into marriage. Are you ready to have a child tomorrow? Uh, that no, pastor, uh, no, brother Zadok. I'm like, so what if you go into that marriage and your husband says, we want a child like today? Are you ready? to take care of the child. And I realized she's not even ready about it, but she's too excited. And I, immediately you realize that she is fallen in love. She's not risen to love because love is a principle. It weighs the cost, it counts. So you need to see that very important point. You need to see that. And so the sister tells me, I am not ready like to have a child. And of course, I'm not saying that everyone who enters into marriage must be ready to have a child then, but, but they must be ready that should we choose to have a, parent, a child, I can take care of my child. So that maturity is lacking in many young people. And then children are rushed into marriage to become mothers and fathers. All right? They do not know basic house schools. They do not know basic housework. They do not know that you need to clean. They are ever on the phone 24-7. You need to clean the house. Here is a case where their mother leaves, comes from the market very late. Here is a woman who is in the house, planning to be married, doesn't know that if mommy is away, 
I should be able to do this to prepare food and she finds everything ready. She is not mature. She is inexperienced. She is inexperienced in many things. She is inexperienced also in what we call being able to discern, discernment. Are you able to discern matters? Here you are having a man who wants to enter into marriage. He cannot discern when a lady is unwell and you know a lady could be going through a period she doesn't need to tell you you should be experienced enough to understand you want to enter into a marriage and you want to be talking to your wife every now you telling you that uh i i am sick uh i mean um uh, you need to be in a position where you know this is not sickness this is some normal cycle that a woman has to go through and i can tell that it is that i don't need to force her to tell me what it is so there is that maturity that will show that someone is responsible can he buy his own clothes all right can he be able to buy his own clothes can this man who is being called into marriage we'll talk about that in the second can he be able to be responsible to organize his money and say, when I get my money, I don't just look at big forms and I look at a nice this and a nice this and a nice this. Do I also think about caring for my parents? Do I think about caring for my siblings? Do I think about someone else or all the money I have? I'm on? If you find a man who spends all his money on you, and doesn't care what the parents are going to she will do for you everything that she will not do for the parents or the sisters and you're not yet married or the brothers that man is not the right man for you the right man must understand that number one his money is not your money before you are married And so you don't expect to be writing your budget and sending to the man and you're not married. Because that one in case during courtship, we say, because courtship will be telling us, are you compatible? That's the work of courtship. So during courtship, if this thing comes that, oh, you are honey to a diabetic patient, good foods, not compatible. And so we say, okay, if that's the case, this marriage, uh, this, this engagement has to stop. If it stops and you have been investing your money, you'll be the most disappointed person. So you're not going to invest money, telling me to pay rent and telling me to do this and telling me to do this and telling me to do this. I'm taking the work of a husband. So we have to talk about financial management. But then there are cases where you can understand, just like any other friend. Perhaps someone has a sick mother and. Uh, I didn't and you didn't as you could help any other person we are not trying to be fanatical of course so satan is trying to do this as much as he can to hurry inexperienced people into marriage ellen white says in adventist home 71 we was about to end if men and women are in the habit of praying twice a day before they contemplate marriage they should pray Four times a day when such a step is anticipated. Listen carefully, youths. This might not be easy on us. But the truth of the matter is, it is not when you have identified the woman and is crazy about her, or when you have identified the man, that you multiply your prayers. How do you pray for a mind that is already made up? It is those who are contemplating. I am thinking that now God is calling me into marriage. I am thinking that now... I should have a family. I am thinking that this, if I get a woman who is help, will help me to meet this purpose in life. All right. Then you've got then to begin praying four times. If you're praying twice. So I don't know if you're praying three times, you want to go six times. You're going to pray more than you are praying before. Why? Because you need heavenly discernment. You need heavenly discernment on who is the right person. You need heavenly discernment. And sometimes people say, 
uh, I had a brother called me and we interacted quite a bit. I'll not mention his name. But he told me now, brother, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, um, uh, we were actually having a phone call. And uh, he's a faithful uh, brother. I love him. And in this phone call, he was telling me about how, how difficult um, it is uh, to find a woman uh, within the, the, the movement that people would believe in. And then, of course, as we were interacting, uh, the brother uh, told me, uh, would you be able to find me somewhere? I said, praise the Lord, if I would be an Eliezer, but I'm not very good at that. But uh, it would be an interesting thing for me to be able to get someone. And I pray that I might be able to help you. I said, that's a good thing. But I told him, hey, I also thought about the same thing when we were getting married. And uh, I said, um, God, uh, I want to get married, but there is no one. And I was looking at the people who are there, and I thought that God would only work with the people who are there. Now, it was during my time of prayer that God brought uh, my wife now into that truth into that message that I was believing. Now, I took more moments and time to just try to see if she is um, having, I mean, a direction towards uh, what uh, I am having in terms of belief and concepts. And I just realized, wow, praise the Lord. She's, she's, she's seeing things almost the way I see them, not exactly the way I see them. And so uh, you don't have to see them exactly the way another person sees them, but at least we are taking the, the same direction. So then I praise the Lord for that because I was trying to tell this brother, there are many of God's sheep outside there. They will hear the voice of God. What you need to be praying about right now is God to show you and God will bring those people because they are men of God who have believed the truth, who are like Nathaniel studying that Bible under the oak tree. And I'll tell you that it's only by prayer that your eyes will be open. You see angels are going up and down and they'll show you there is Nathaniel right down under the tree. And Nathaniel is studying the Bible and he's seeking. And this time I'm using Nathaniel as the man. I'm using Nathaniel as the woman. God will lead you to that woman and to that man. Doesn't need to be the people you are seeing in your circle every moment, every now and then. All right. So then um, you need to pray more. Uh, and uh, uh, um, let the Bible in this time be your guide. She says in M MYP, messages to young people 446, the question is asked, where shall a young man cleanse his way? And the answer is given by taking it according to the word. The young man who makes the Bible his guide need not mistake the path of duty and of safety. That blessed book will teach him to preserve his integrity of character, to be truthful, to practice no deception. And so when you entering into marriage or into courtship, into engagement, deception is the last thing, truthfulness. And the only thing that can guide you into that is the Bible. The Bible will guide you. And so if you want to know that God is calling you to marriage, you must be studying your Bible to know what it is that your Bible is saying. Um, to know what is it that your Bible is saying. Uh, we are told in Patriots and Prophets 634, in deciding upon any course of action, we are not to ask whether we can see that harm, uh, that see that harm will result from it, but whether it is in keeping with the will of God. So the question is, is it keeping with the will of God? Is it keeping with the will of God? When God knows you are ready for responsibility of commitment, he'll reveal the right person under the right circumstances. I want you to go with that home. When God knows you are ready for responsibility of commitment, he will reveal a right person under the right circumstances. So I don't have to create for God circumstances. I don't have to tell God it is in a youth seminars, or I don't have to tell God, oh, you know what? We have to organize uh, some online um, group where we have single SDA people. No. When you are ready for commitment and prayerful, I don't know how God is going to do it. It must not, might not be how he did it for me. Because as for me, it's even, it's even interesting because I had preached 
and eaten in my wife's house many years ago. Not even noticing, not even knowing how our face looks like. But God arranged a circumstance. And so I can say that you don't have to make these mechanics people are making, uh, mechanical arrangements that people are making. Indeed, what will happen is God, when he realizes that you have committed yourself to be the right person, to be the child of God, he will actually arrange. Because he's the one who's called you. And we know that his biddings are is you'd finish with me and Netflix. So, so you have to understand. I want to mention this before I pray for you. The road to marriage, those who enter into dating, they're commonly called dating. I don't have to go into a debate about words and nothing much, but the common dating of today is random. But when you are entering into a God-led course, it is not random. It is deliberate. You don't wake one day and you say, I bumped into a woman and she's beautiful and she puts on a long dress. I think she can be my wife. Uh, no, 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 no. That is random. Dating is random. You bump into people. You are surprised and all these things. But godly, when God is calling someone into marriage, it's a deliberate decision. It is, Lord, I think that right now, uh, by studying your word, by engaging on uh, 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 meditation as to what you're showing me, I am ready to prepare for marriage. Uh, when you are dating according to the word scope today, the goal is romance. When it is random, the goal is romance. Because when it is random, probably what made you think on that day that you should marry this lady is the way she's dressed, is maybe the way her body looks like, her body shapes. You need to think about this, that after she gives birth, she will not have that body like that. She will not have, uh, perhaps her breasts will not be like that. I want to speak plainly to you guys. I want you to understand that her face might not be like that the way you see them today. Maybe if uh, you take her to the farm and you all dig, uh, you might not see the same hands like that. The fact is, when she's in her home, perhaps she will not, he will not be dressing a nice shirt. He, he, will, he, he, he will be in his, 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 his gamboots and uh, pants for, 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 for working in the field. And he will be shaggy, going about duty, sweating. And you're like, are you going to hug that man from the farm? But if you are truly in love, I mean, you're going to hug your husband even in the farm because you love him. You have no problem with that. But I'll tell you one truth. The dating as it is in today is one, random. And because it is random, what actually perpetuates it is romance. It is not deliberate. When it is deliberate, it's not romance. The goal is marriage. I'm entering into this because I want to get married, not because I want to get romance. Dating is unprotected. Courtship is protected. Why do I say that? When you are in the right path that God is leading you into, you are protected. And what protects you? The word of God, the principles that govern you. But when you are dating, you are, I mean, you are the most um, unprotected, insecure person. Anytime that man can see another woman randomly, that woman can see another man with a flashy car randomly and make decisions, you are, you are very fearful, you are not protected. In the normal dating today, a natural setting of uh, perpetual recreation. A natural setting of perpetual recreation. So when it comes to dating as it is today, things are unnatural. Things are artificial. People meet in clubs. People meet in the streets of towns. I'll tell you, courtship, that, that which God is leading, is in a natural setting of real life and family. We go to families. We speak to parents. We are before elders or church leaders whom we have loved and we trust. We are not doing things hiding. It is a very natural setup. It is a very natural setup. But when you find yourself trying to find a natural setup, you're trying to find a room which is secluded, you are trying to find a club. You're trying to find some hidden hotel somewhere. No one sees it. I mean, you're trying to avoid the parents. That is not going to get you. And you're looking at that process. That process gets us somewhere else. And it's not 
getting us to uh, to um, uh, a little heaven down here. Uh, dating as it is today is a practice for divorce. <laughs> you know why I'm saying that? You know why it's a practice for divorce? Dating as it is today is a practice for divorce because it is coming to union breakup. Coming to union breakup. And I'll talk about that because people do not know, especially when they have intercourse, that there is part of your DNA that actually when God created the gift of sex for our partners, that there is a part of your DNA that remains in the person that you are getting hooked up with and you be, being united with. And what happens is, there will be trouble when you keep uniting with more people. And that might affect you one day when you settle in marriage. People do not know that. And so I need to understand that if not for the grace of God, many marriages would be suffering. But the grace of God calms down, reduces the effect of those consequences, doesn't remove them completely. Because if you study very well, that's the purpose of burnt offering. But offering takes care of sins of ignorance. You understand that now? So what happens is, dating as it is today is a practice for divorce. We practice how to divorce and separation. But courtship is commitment. You are committing yourself that if you will have to actually separate or disengage, it is because of principles were laid. And that is why those who have followed the course of God, when they separate, they sit down. They don't separate by throwing themselves and calling themselves on phone and insulting themselves and doing all these things. And if they call themselves, perhaps if they began the relationship on a phone, so they end it on a phone. But if you began the relationship sitting down with a clear mind, that relationship ends sitting down on a clear mind, you can be able to go to that sister tomorrow, greet her, wish her a blessed marriage ahead, uh, pray for her, ask her for, um, for help. In fact, you can invite that woman to your wedding and she can invite you to our wedding and they, you both wish one another the very best because you understood the directions you are taking and you are basically saying, if we go in this direction, we can follow our impulse, but our marriage will not be successful. Because what I'm seeking is not what you're seeking. And so you are, she understands that I am not leaving you because I have found someone else. I am leaving you because I have found that we are not going to glorify God. What I like is not what you like. And we are not going to be happy. It is better we disagree today than live forever unhappy. And this must be seen in your life. And how? You are not going to enter into another relationship after two days. You are going to spend time to pray. And it will prove to the other partner that indeed, he didn't leave me having seen another person. He left me because of that principle. So that, that is very important for you to see. So the other one is a practice for divorce. But the courtship that God is leading us to is a training for marriage. If you follow these principles, you are training yourself for marriage, except with a few, uh, uh, a few principles, a uh, few enjoyments denied you. Okay, dating is rose-colored glasses. But when you are following the method of God, it is a magnifying glass, right? The dating of today is a rose-colored, rose-colored. Everything is beautiful. You are this right man. He wants to buy you the old world. Have you ever thought about it? And we are in trouble because when the old world belongs to you, where are we going to live? We, we are going to begin asking ourselves questions. The old world has been bought to Sister Stacy, for example, she's not here today, or perhaps Sister Winnie, I can see her. So yeah, they've bought you the old world. But now after buying you the old world, where is you other people want to live? Just trying to jog your mind. I mean, is trying to promise you unrealistic things. Things that he himself cannot be able to keep and live up to. So it is a rosy, um, uh, a rosy uh, glass, I mean, a rose-colored glass. Uh, it's a bed of roses. The normal uh, dating that leads to marriage. But when you are in that courtship, engagement, marriage, procedures followed by, uh, called on by God as we end, 
it's a magnifying glass. And how is it a magnifying glass? Because it broadens your mind. You begin to see yourself, your limitations, your weaknesses. The woman the same. You begin to learn her. See if you can be able to accommodate her weaknesses. So these weaknesses, you cannot be able to accommodate. And then in this magnifying glass, you are praying and asking God and you, you are very sober. And if we follow that direction, we are going to actually come into the most holy place experience, which is when we are united together in a holy matrimony and we are experiencing the full love. Youths, my prayer for us, married people, my prayer for us is that we may experience that full joy, that full joy that is written in John chapter 16, verses 24. God bless us. God be with us. Let's pray. Holy Father in heaven, my time is spent on a holy Sabbath. Bless your people wherever they are and help us to make right choices, to understand that you are calling us into a holy union that was made to reveal who you are to your son. If we misrepresent our marriages to the world, we misrepresent you and your relationship. And though we might speak of knowing who you are, we will misrepresent you to the world and the world will have no love for being drawn to you. To us who are married, may we recommit ourselves to the vows that we made. May you save our families from the gutter of mess. And Lord, may you restore that image which you designed, the Edenic ideal of love, of oneness, of purity in our very own marriages that the society may love us. This may love what they are seeing in our marriages. This is our prayer by faith in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen.